All right, once again, good evening. It is so nice to see people here in the room again. It's been way too long. And uh, if ever there were the right time to regather and, and shake hands and give hugs and see each other again, it's the Steve Bennett annual program here on Cutting Edge that we do every year with the American Arbitration Association and these fine, fine experts who from some gesture of generosity keep agreeing to come back every year and share their insights and, and wisdom with us. Welcome to, of course, to those of you who are uh, on Zoom, uh, we're excited uh, to have you with us, and we're very excited that the AAA in New York Law School can extend uh, our reach uh, across the country and indeed around the world for, for many of you. With respect to uh, CLE, as I remind uh, the remote uh, participants uh, every time we offer these programs, we have sent you a form by email that we would ask you please to have at your disposal and on certain, uh, on four different occasions during the evening, Jeff Zeno and Reka, our two moderators will, will announce code words. And in order to prove that you're still online and still listening, we'll ask you to write those code words down and, and send it to Rose White uh, here at the law school as the form signifies. Those of you in the audience, of course, don't have to worry about that because your presence is, is, is uh, clearly documented. And, uh, and so the, only the people online have to worry about the codes. Jeff, did I forget anything? All right, come on up here. And please uh, have me welcome Jeff and Rekha to another Steve Bennett program on arbitration. Thank you so much. Okay, one second. Let me turn on my iPad here. It's great to be here tonight. Um, we have a great program. Uh, and uh, we have a great audience uh, here in person, but also virtual. We have over 80 people in the virtual world. For the virtual people, please feel free to ask questions throughout. Uh, we're, we have a, a monitor here. We can uh, answer questions. And for the people in person, just raise your hand. Okay, so tonight we have six great panelists like uh, uh, Peter mentioned. And Peter, thank you so much. It's great to be collaborating with New York Law School. We've been doing this now for seven years. Uh, you know, it, I can't believe it's been seven years. And the first time we did it was uh, 2016. And we had six people every year we do six people. This year, we're changing it up a little bit with respect to how we do the format. Uh, the questions we're going to ask are going to be for every single panelist. So just uh, be aware of that. We're not going to have teams of two people this year. And before we get started, I just want to say something about Steve Bennett. Steve Bennett, we named this program after him in uh, 2019. He passed away in December of 2019. He was a friend, uh, an arbitrator, father, a great person. He added so much to this program every year. Uh, he was on this program for three years, so we named the program after him. And it's, it's a great honor. So I want to give a moment of silence for Steve Bennett. Okay, thank you. All right, so Reka, I'm going to give you the honor to introduce our esteemed panelists. We're not really sure Jeff can pronounce all the names. So uh, here I come in. No, first and foremost, really deep, deep and sincere thanks to Peter for inviting us back here to do this. And of course, to Jeff for inviting me to join him as a co-moderator. Um, we will try to keep this light, although important, and get into some critical issues. With that, what I will do is quickly name recognize each of our speakers, then afford them an opportunity for a one minute sort of bio if they'd like to offer it, and then we'll get into it. So I'll start from my far right. Leslie Burkhoff is a partner at Morit Huck and Hamroff in New York. Next to her, Richard Macchiaccio, a chartered arbitrator. Next to him, Dana McGrath. McGrath Arbitration. Next to her, Richard Silverberg, a partner at Dorsey and Whitney. And next to him, we have David Singer of Singer ADR Neutral Services. Last but not least, next to him, Steve Skolnick of Thomson Reuters. Many of these also lovely speakers also double hat both 
in the profession I just named them in, but also as an independent arbitrator or switching with that council. So we're getting a really interesting perspective. What I do wanna offer them the floor for a moment, going from Steve down the line again, to just tell them a little bit about themselves briefly. They have one minute, we're timing, but Steve. We are timing. Please. Hi everyone. Um, I, I, I was in general commercial practice doing litigation and arbitration for 30, four years, I think. Um, and now I, um, and I've been an arbitrator for at least 20 of those. I do mostly that. I'm also at Thomson Reuters, I'm at the practical law division where I write and, and curate materials on international arbitration. I'm David Singer. I started uh, Singer ADR Neutral Services uh, a little over five years ago. So I'm a full-time neutral arbitrator and mediator. I'm a former partner at Dorsey and Whitney until then. And uh, while I was at Dorsey, I was an arbitrator and mediator increasingly since the mid uh, 90s. Actually, I started as a small claims court in 1985. So I just uh, based a bit and uh, I've been doing it ever since. Good evening. I'm Rich Silberberg. Uh, as David mentioned, uh, we were partners at Dorsey and Whitney. I'm still there. This is my last year. Uh, but David, since you mentioned it, uh, I just thought I would uh, thank you because if you recall, you were the person who wrote my nominating letter for the AAA roster. I appreciate that. It goes back. You got on. I got on. You know, Rich, I did not know that. I did not know that. Outstanding. Uh, that must have been in the early 90s. Uh, so I've been arbitrating and mediating cases probably for about 30 years, and it's a delight to be back. Hello, my name is Dana McGrath, and I am now a full-time arbitrator. I launched my independent arbitrator practice about two years ago, and prior to that, I was an arbitration practitioner with various international arbitration groups. And I am also an adjunct professor of international arbitration at Fordham Law School and just got back from the end of this. So adjusting to being back in New York and in person, very excited to be here. Hi, I'm Richard Mattiaccio and uh, just working. I, um, I have been practicing as counsel since 1983 in, in arbitration and as an arbitrator since 1987. Uh, most, I would say a majority of my years in practice, I've practiced with Steve Skolnick on the other end of the table. Um, and uh, I, during COVID, I, I became a full-time arbitrator um, in an independent capacity. My practice has mostly been commercial, domestic commercial and international commercial uh, with IP highlights. We're getting some comments from the virtual audience. Please move your microphones closer, everyone. If everyone could just move their microphones. And just a for the record, though, there's a sign here that says, please do not move your microphones. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Peter, is that okay? We have them. Is this better? Okay. So hopefully that works. I'm Leslie Burkoff. Uh, I'm with the firm, as we indicated, at Marit Hock and Hamroff. Perfect. I chair the firm's dispute resolution practice. Uh, I have a background in uh, commercial litigation and restructuring. Um, I split my time. I'm not a full-time in the area of mediation and arbitration. About a third to 40% a, a of my time is in that area. Um, I do it within the uh, bankruptcy arena as well as the commercial arena. Um, sitting on a various uh, amount of commercial panels, as well as in the AAA, I'm on the large complex case panel, uh, the commercial panel, consumer panel, um, international, I sit on the ICDR, a member of the council, um, both as mediator and as arbitrator. Okay, we also- Let me just say oh, one more thing. Please, Richard. I have the privilege of currently serving on an arbitration panel with four of the six people. One, <laughs> there you do. There is a full disclosure. You have it. <laughs> I have served with the other two. We're, um, what we hope to bring you beyond critical issues and critical thinking is some levity. We all happen to be friends across the stage, which is really fun. Um, another fun fact, um, and we'll posit these throughout as we can. 
Richard Macchiaccio is certainly a Richard. Richard Silverberg is a rich. So please do not interchange them as you talk to them after in cocktails. Also a very warm and hearty um, hello and welcome to all of those who are joining us online. We see you. We see your uh, chat messages as well. So please be vocal as you choose to be into the chat and we'll acknowledge questions as they come up. Uh, but thrilled to see so many familiar faces joining us in hybrid. Yeah. How many do we have virtual? I can't see the number. I thought I saw it before. Regardless, okay, we'll get started. Okay, we have about three topics. We may add in another topic. We have uh, three to four topics tonight. And like Jeff, I Jeff is keeping a hot button topic. I know you're all thrilled to hear it. It'll be the fourth topic. Three main in chief. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so we have uh, three great topics that uh, our panelists have prepared for. The first topic is, and a lot of you've heard of this before, delicate balance between the muscular arbitrator and party autonomy. Okay, how does the arbitrators handle that? We're going to give each arbitrator eight minutes to talk about this. Okay, but Rich gave me something to tee this up for the audience and for them. And I'm going to read it. So I couldn't memorize it today. I'm not that smart and have that much time. Commercial arbitrators are trained to resolve disputes promptly and economically. Such training also reminds arbitrators that arbitration is the party's process. We believe that strongly at the AAA. So what happens when the parties or their counsel and the arbitrator don't share that aspiration that the case be resolved efficiently and economically. Suppose the parties jointly submit a case management plan with a three-year lifespan that incorporates multiple rounds of document requests, a dozen more depositions, written interrogatories, expert discovery, and pre-answer and post-discovery motion practice. The arbitrator can certainly push back and try to conjole the parties to, into adhering to the hallmarks of arbitration. But once the arbitrator has exhausted those efforts to no avail, what is the proper role of the arbitrator at that point? Okay, thank you, Rich, that was great. Okay, so we will turn to Leslie first. We'll go, we'll go down, right down in order. Leslie, you have the floor. So we thought we'd, you were gonna give that to Rich with his question. Um, so, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough question because as, as you're, you know, you point out it is the party's process um, you know, we always sit as a lens um, and we open the floor oftentimes, or at least I do, in, in the initial conferences of trying to remind the parties that arbitration is not litigation. Um, you know, when I hear that they submitted something with a three-year lifespan, um, when they've submitted a, an outline of a process with a robust, and that's probably putting it mildly given Rich's script there, um, and I've been in a situation where I had an order, a draft order come in with a ridiculous amount of um, interrogatories and depositions. And, um, you know, as you know, the AAA sends out a draft form. Um, and, and in one instance, I had one where you, you had choices, you know, pick this or that. The parties were, they picked both on every instance. They picked A and B, one and two. Um, they did that actually in that instance because they didn't want to have a disagreement with each other. When I drilled down, um, they, they were so willing to have an agreement between each other, they left a three-party panel in place in a tiny dispute because the agreement called for it. Um, so in that instance, the parties did not want to be at odds with each other and they just figured more was better so that they didn't have a disagreement. Um, in Rich's example, I presume it's because they each felt like they needed as much as possible they were worried to leave any stone unturned. Um, I think at some point you can simply as an arbitrator do your level best to try and control the process. Um, and then the suggestion that I would have is, and if you can get the parties to buy into it is, maybe put it in stages, is to keep the cost down, sorry, the mic is just weird, um, is to try and suggest to the parties that we still limit it, and give them perhaps the ability to come back and ask for more. So instead of doing, you know, three years of X, or I don't have Rich's example exactly in front of me, 50, you know, 50 of this and 40 of that, you know, let's start X and see if you really need Y. Because once you've given them everything, they're just going to use it whether they really need it or not, in my mind, because they think it's available to them. And that just doesn't seem to me to make a lot of sense. Um, because that's not what arbitration is supposed to be. 
Um, at some point, you just may have to let the parties do what the parties are going to do, because again, they've picked it, they're paying for it. Um, you can outline it, you can explain it, you can curtail it um, and do your best to, I think, try and stage it and maybe convince them, hopefully, to set parameters and maybe do a second set and come back a second time. But I'm not sure at what point that you can completely outweigh them or overrule them if it is their process and they've picked it. If you have done everything that we are supposed to do as arbitrators to explain what the process is supposed to be, why it is different than litigation, why it is not supposed to be full and unfettered litigation without any boundaries whatsoever. Um, because at some point you're just gonna get them coming back and complaining whether it's the case administrator or the vice president of the region that they've picked this process. They don't care what we have to say as an arbitrator or as a, as a panel, you know, they want what they want and by golly, they're going to get it, even if it's going to cost them three times as much. And by the way, at the end, they will probably then complain, gee, you know, arbitration costs 10 times more than litigation and isn't it supposed to be less expensive? Notwithstanding the fact that they drove their truck over this process and ran ramp shot over it. No, and then the parties will blame, I mean, not the parties, the litigators will blame the AAA or, the, or you guys, the arbitrators, and I see that all the time. And I've had cases where we have had arbitrators removed because both sides have said enough is enough, you're not letting it be the party's process. So thank you. That was great. Is it Richard or Rich? Richard. Richard. <laughs> sure. Richard, you're, not, you're up. My mother taught me years ago that I should not let anyone call me Rich until they made me so. <laughs> no, one, no one has done that yet. So I have to insist on Richard. Um, so I agree with everything Leslie had to say. The, um, and we can all have a discussion about the different techniques that arbitrators use to try to keep the parties uh, in a process that's consistent with being in arbitration. But ultimately, it is their process. Uh, and after having you know, used every trick in the book, try to get the parties to approach the case reasonably if they still insist that this is how they want to do it, it is their process. But I do think it's important to, to note that being a muscular arbitrator, which was the, which was the term that could have been trademarked by, by the AAA some years ago, I don't think they did, um, involves cajoling. It does not involve um, being a dictator. This, we're not, we're not uh, ultimately, we don't have the power to impose an approach on the party. So what we do have is the power of the bully pulpit uh, to try to get them, to try to educate them to some degree, to try to get them to be more comfortable with the process um, as it has evolved and to, and to make use of it. Very often, I think counsel are just concerned that because they're used to doing it in a certain way in litigation, that if they don't do it that way, they're, they're not adequately representing their client. They just don't trust this other approach. You have to make them comfortable uh, that, that they can be effective advocates their clients. So there's a lot of diplomacy as well as firmness that goes into getting the parties into a, an arbitration mindset. Um, but there is one area I'd like to mention where I think arbitrators have more latitude, even when the parties agree that they want to do it, you know, in uh, sort of classic court litigation, um, take no prisoners war, um, where I think the arbitrators have a lot of latitude is in third party discovery. Because here we're in a position of having to think about the rights of third parties who are not there at the point where the parties are asking for extensive subpoenas that will impose on third parties. And there I think we can uh, really um, be very careful and very restrictive and I tend to be so in, in uh, subpoenas of third parties, uh, insisting on understanding why it's necessary to impose on third parties, why the document uh, requests that are attached to the subpoena are really necessary. Um, and I know that there are some arbitrators who still 
take the old view, I'll just sign anything and see if the parties comply with it. And I think that's one area where we need to be very vigilant because every third party who receives a subpoena is a potential user of arbitration. And that subpoena may be the first time that they have any experience with arbitration. And it'll be a bad experience if the subpoena is unreasonable um, or on its face, unenforceable. So I think that's an area where we have more latitude than the situation that's been posited, which is both sides after being cajoled, you know, insist they wanna do it their way. And then I think you can make a record um, of the advice you've given, um, but it is their process in the end. Richard, great point, but uh, you've done programs on the dynamics of a tribunal. What do you do when your fellow arbitrators don't agree with what you just said? How do you handle that? Have you had that experience? You don't have to name anybody tonight. No, no. <laughs> I, really, I really haven't. You know, it's, people talk about these issues more differently than they actually handle them. I mean, I haven't seen a lot of difference in approach uh, when I've actually been on a panel. I think we just come to a consensus. Great. Okay. Thank you. Dana, you're up. So I agree with what has been said um, by the um, It is a delicate balance between making sure that the process is as efficient as possible while allowing the parties to you know, exercise their autonomy and sort of define the process in the way they think is best suited to bringing out the evidence that they think is important to proving their case. So I would say earlier in the process of an arbitration, I, I ask more questions and hear their justification for what they've jointly proposed, especially when almost the entire schedule, if not the entire schedule is, proposed, is jointly proposed. Um, I think it's important uh, to, to ask why they've proposed that and understand it. And, and then to the extent that you know, it seems to, to be consistent with their goals in the proceeding to respect party autonomy. I have found that as an arbitration unfolds, where there was seemingly agreement, um, there's actually not as much agreement as was initially thought um, with even the, the meaning of certain terms. Like I've had a case um, with someone on this panel where there was actually a fundamental different understanding of what the word deposition meant and depositions had been agreed to. So we learned later in the proceeding that there actually had not really been an agreement on the same thing, or you know, there wasn't an agreement. They, they were using vocabulary that they interpreted very differently. So you know, there's only so much you can understand about what the parties have proposed in their schedule at the beginning. And when the terms are very familiar to you, you wouldn't think, well, what does document production mean to you? What does it mean to you? I mean, that would be a four hour preliminary hearing. But in reality, a lot of these issues come up midstream during the arbitration. And that's where I find it's like the most important time to be muscular if you're gonna be so, and to clearly explain why you've taken the decisions you've taken. And um, like Richard, I've never had, um, disagreement amongst a three-member tribunal when it comes to an issue of needing to be muscular and sort of guide the parties. Um, but uh, maybe I've just been lucky like Richard. Great. Thank you, Dana. Rich? Well, I'll take it upon myself to inject a little controversy into the discussion. So I do reach the same conclusion at the end of the day. The safe course for any arbitrator is to honor what the parties want to do. Uh, the only way to really get in trouble is to depart from what the parties want to do. However, I think the issue is more difficult than that because I believe that there is a conflict between one's duty to the process and one's duty to the parties in the kind of hypothetical that was posed. So to illustrate that, timing is everything, right? 
earlier today, all of us received from the AAA a document to be signed by DocuSign uh, entitled Standards and Responsibilities for Members of the AAA Roster of Arbitrators and Mediators. Paragraph one states, among other things, quote, the responsibilities inherent in the role of an arbitrator include A, understanding that the arbitration and mediation processes are expeditious, more efficient, and less formal alternatives to litigation, and B, commitment to speed, economy, and a just resolution for controversies brought before them. So this is the these are the first two commitments in a two or three page document that every arbitrator commits annually to perform. So with that background, and also the background of the commercial arbitration rules, which have some interesting things to say about this, the arbitrator approaches a preliminary hearing in which the parties say, this is what we want. We want the equivalent of a court case in the context of arbitration. And we are not interested in speed. We're not interested in um, cost. It's a big case. Um, frankly, we've got other cases. We don't want to be pushed. Um, we need all the time that we're proposing. And what does the arbitrator do in that context? And as you've heard from my, my colleagues, the appropriate thing for the arbitrator to do is to try to get the parties through their counsel to align with the hallmarks of arbitration, and that is speed and economy. So you've heard some of the techniques that have been mentioned. Try to get them to, instead of eight depositions, say, how about you start with one, and then you see what you get, and then you come back and make a case as to why you need another and tell me who is the next opponent and why you need that next opponent and why you're gonna be prejudiced if you don't have that opponent. Sometimes that works. In fact, I think it works a fair amount. But every now and then you encounter a case in which the parties make it clear that regardless of how they ended up in arbitration, that's not really where they want to be. The lawyers who are handling these cases before us are not the lawyers in most cases who chose arbitration. The lawyers who chose arbitration are the corporate lawyers who are the deal makers, if you will, who in more instances than we'd like to admit, at the 11th hour before the contract is signed, call somebody up and say, you have an arbitration clause? Can you send it down or can, better yet, can you email it to me? And they drop it into the agreement. And the, then the litigators take over when the dispute arises. And a fair amount of the time, they regret the decision that, there has, that has been made previously to commit the case to arbitration because litigators are trained to do the opposite of what the hallmarks of arbitration are. Litigators are trained, particularly in larger firms, to turn over every stone and not to miss something. Because if you miss something, you'll be criticized for it by the client, by a senior partner, what have you. So there is this conflict. And the rules actually, in some instances, reflect more authority on the part of the arbitrator, even where the parties may feel otherwise. So let's take just one instance. And this involves the amendment, which we'll be talking about later, to Rule 34. Rule 34 uh, used to be called Rule 33, uh, entitled Dispositive Motions. And under Rule 33 uh, of the old rules, the requirement for the arbitrator to entertain a dispositive motion was that the party would have to show that the motion is likely to succeed 
and also that the granting of the motion would dispose of or narrow the issues in the case. But now there's an amendment and there's a subparagraph B and that says consistent with the goal of achieving an efficient and economical resolution of the dispute, the arbitrator shall consider the time and cost associated with the briefing of a dispositive motion in deciding whether to allow any such motion. So in this particular instance, even if both parties want to make motions and are perfectly happy with having the, the adversary file such a motion, these rules empower the arbitrator to say no, either because the arbitrator isn't convinced that it's a winner or the arbitrator believes that this is not going to advance the hallmarks of arbitration, of efficiency and uh, economics. So if you take the same philosophy that's embedded in subparagraph B of new rule 34, and you apply it to depositions, for example, uh, we have something that's similar in that the large complex case procedures actually discourage the use of depositions. The rules themselves do not mention depositions, the commercial rules. But if it's a large complex case where the authors of the rules anticipated that depositions would be most likely to be requested, there is actually a passage which says that they should be allowed only in rare instances, effectively. So I think that the issue is harder than it may seem at first blush. Um, when, when you say it's the party's process, you go back to the agreement, and if the arbitration agreement were to provide, as some of them do, that the federal rules of civil procedure shall apply, we've all seen those, then that's part of the commitment that the arbitrator undertakes to enforce. And then all of these concerns about efficiency and economy are by the boards. But suppose the, the arbitration agreement says that arbitration shall be before a panel of three arbitrators who shall deliver an expeditious resolution of the dispute. Then you've got a conflict between what the written contract says and what the lawyers are telling you when they say they effectively want to turn over every rock. So I, I'll just close by saying that I think that the arbitrator is on safe ground when the arbitrator hears the parties out, does his or her best to try to get the parties to observe the goals of arbitration, and whether the arbitrator succeeds or not, the arbitrator has then discharged her or his responsibility to the process. But I think that there is a little bit of a schizophrenic um, concept uh, inherent in these kinds of scenarios. Right. Thank you, Rich. Uh, for those in the virtual world, we have our first CLE word. Okay, the first CLE word is American. Okay, the first CLE word is American for only for those in the virtual world. You guys have signed your CLEs that are in person. Okay, so thank you again, Rich and uh, David. Oh, we wonder out loud what the next word is. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, first of all, for the record, let me say that I agree with everything that's been said by my predecessor. I, and I'll try not to, you know, sort of, sort of say the same thing or repeat what's already been said. I think that the scenario that we're confronting is not common. I think uh, far more often than not, uh, at least one of the one side, presumably the, the claimant, typically the claimant wants to move things along and doesn't want to get bogged down in lengthy proceedings and uh, disproportionately expensive, expensive proceedings. Okay, better? Yep. Yep. Okay, uh, so uh, 
But it does happen, and there is, as, as Rich described, there's a tension between our obligation to the process to move things along expeditiously, efficiently, and the uh, desire to provide the parties with what they what they bargained for, what they agreed to in, in having their dispute resolved via arbitration. So sometimes I, I'm influenced by, in these circumstances, counsel, who counsel is. Uh, if they're very experienced, if they really seem very capable, they know what they're doing, I trust them. I may be more open to, um, and they give reasonable explanations for why they need more time for this or that, or why they feel they need to perhaps more uh, more discovery than I might otherwise have thought was necessary. I, that, that may influence me. If I think that counsel really doesn't know what they're doing and they're unnecessarily uh, turning this into a litigation, uh, especially if the case is not huge and the expense associated with all that they want to do is disproportionate, uh, I will push back and I'll push back you know, significantly. Um, I just finished a case involving two very major firms and involved a lot of money, tens of millions, at least maybe hundreds. They didn't actually disclose exactly how much was uh, uh, at, you know, in, in dispute. Um, but they came up with, a, with a, uh, a schedule that was quite involved, but it made sense. And they actually did it all in six months. So it wasn't a time issue, but there was a lot of work that was done, but they got it all done with very little uh, input from uh, the tribunal. And uh, the, the, the hearing went forward and, and very smoothly. Uh, I have another case in, in, in which I'm uh, uh, on a tribunal where um, actually the firms are well known. It's not like they're <laughs> not well known or well regarded firms, but they have spent a year or more on, on document discovery. And it, admittedly, it is complicated but it has now compelled us to be involved on conference calls every two, three weeks to sort of sit on them and make sure they get done what they needed to get done. Uh, so you can have very, very varying experiences. But um, to get more specific, I mean, basically the expense and time uh, is taken in two contexts. One is discovery, and the second is in motion practice. So what I have done, and this has been alluded to, um, already is if let's say take depositions, which is always very time consuming and expensive and often unnecessary. Each side wants to take a bunch of uh, depositions. I will come back and depending upon the size of the case, depending upon how many depositions, if any, I think are appropriate from, the, from the, my perspective, I will say, why don't you each take eight hours of deposition or seven hours of deposition or 10 hours of deposition, whatever the case may be, you only want one deposition, well, you can take as much time as you want within those eight hours. Eight hours. You wanna take three depositions, why don't you divide up as you see fit those three depositions within eight hours and come back to me if you need more depositions or if you need more time. So I've done this approach dozens of times, scores of times. And not once has counsel ever come back to me and said, I need more time or I need to make more depositions. I really believe that it's zero. I can't think of an instance. If someone were to come to me and say, we want rounds of, uh, of document requests, I would say, do one. And if you have a problem, come back to me and we'll discuss it. I've never had them come back to me to discuss it. They say, we want interrogatories and we want depositions. I'll question that. Why don't you take your depositions if you feel you need interrogatories, come back to me and we'll discuss it. Never happens. Sometimes I'll say, you know, go forward and do a, what we would call colloquially a Southern District of New York uh, interrogatories, which are very, very limited in scope and let that go forward. But typically I don't, I don't really entertain interrogatories. So in example after example, um, I do that, I will limit it. I will not deprive them. I will not deny them the opportunity to do it, but I will limit it and give them the opportunity to come back to me if they need more. And invariably that simply doesn't happen. Um, there are certain um, expert, uh, there I think in the scenario was uh, expert depositions. I typically don't see the need for that. Exchange your expert reports. And if you really need uh, depositions, come back to me. Again, 
nothing. So that's really how I handle uh, how I handle discovery, which to me is the main where the main abuses take place. As it relates to motion practice, I'll say up front, among many other things covered at the preliminary hearing, uh, that I won't be entertaining discovery motions. If you have an issue with regard to discovery, try to work it out yourselves. If you can't, send me a letter. You send me a letter up to three pages by a certain date. And then the next day or a day after, I'll schedule a conference and we'll resolve the discovery issues then. As it relates to dispositive motions, Rich has already dis discussed some of that. Uh, as it relates to considering you know, proportionality and whether it makes sense, the cost, et cetera. Uh, but even without getting to the proportionality issue, um, it's generally accepted that the way to go is not to just allow dispositive motions to be made, but rather to uh, require that the parties provide you with a letter uh, or one party provide you with a letter. The other side uh, likely opposes that the request and will submit a letter in opposi opposition seeking leave to make a motion. And it'll be up to you, the arbitrator, to see whether it makes sense. Will it, uh, does it seem like it, there's, there's merit to the uh, proposed uh, motion? Uh, even if there is merit to it, would it substantially uh, narrow the issues or shorten the amount of time that uh, hearing time and so this is really part of, and I think going back to rule 34 and 34A, this process is, is, is uh, called for, uh, seeking leave, receiving permission to make a motion rather than just making a motion like you can do in court. And, and that really can often be a tremendous waste of time, effort, energy. Uh, so I think those are the two main areas uh, where you can push back and, um, and I think that my experience far often, uh, more than not, uh, the council will, will defer to what you're saying. And especially if you're limiting but not preventing, then that can go forward and you'll end up with the limiting approach and saving a lot of time and expense. Great, thank you, David. So Steve, you have the last word. I see you have no notes. So is that because you're last in line here? Or? <laughs> I don't work with notes. Um, so I, We'll take a little different tack instead of repeating what, what's already been said. Um, in this scenario, in this hypo, I reject the notion that you are respecting party autonomy when you give in to a schedule that is proposed like this. I, my, I posit that the parties agree to arbitration under the AAA commercial rules or the AAA international rules, and that's what they bargained for. The fact that they hired lawyers who are unfamiliar with the process doesn't vitiate the agreement to arbitrate, and arbitration means something different than litigation. How do we avoid this? If I had a case where I'm an arbitrator and any of my colleagues here are counsel, I certainly would have said, here, you go work out your schedule and come to me, and they would come to me with, um, with, with a schedule that I'd have to resolve or the tribunal would have to resolve a few agreements, but it would be a sensible schedule. It wouldn't be this schedule because they all know how arbitration works. If I see or I suspect that counsel are not familiar with arbitration, I'm not going to ask them to agree to a schedule before the, before the first conference because they'll be anchored in the, in, in the agreements that they've reached. And now you're trying to convince them of some, against something they've already agreed to. I'd rather co them come to me without any agreement rather than a really bad agreement. When the case gets, when again, when you have counsel that are inexperienced with arbitration, um, they think they need depositions because they don't realize that they're going to get written witness statements where they're going to be able to have an effective cross-examination without taking depositions. So you, it's your job to start to teach them. And just um, the one example uh, of a case where parties, both very good lawyers on both sides, not experienced in international arbitration, came to me with a, we had a, 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 a first um, procedural conference told me they were estimating 15 days of hearings. You know, this one's going to be six hours on direct, this one's going to be five. And I'm thinking the largest international investment treaty arbitrations that involve hundreds of billions of dollars don't take three weeks, they take a week. Okay. You are not so special that you need three weeks of this tribunal's time. So in a case where parties really don't know what they're doing, you say, fine, that's not how it's going to work. You're going to do written witness statements, you're gonna have 15 minutes of direct. 
we're going to get it done in five or six days. And of course, they're not happy, but usually they don't argue with you. You're the, you're the decision maker. They're, they're, they're respectful to people, even if you're not wearing a robe. And more often than not, or actually every experience that I've had this, um, at the end of the arbitration, you ask parties, is there anything else you want to submit? If you had the opportunity to submit all your evidence, you often thank you for helping them with a, a fashion an efficient process and to, and, and, and to get them off their own, own bad instincts. Um, and I'll just close where I think I may disagree or diff different um, uh, experiences in my colleagues. I've been an arbitrator, an arbitration practitioner for 30 years. I've never seen a case with a deposition. I've never seen a case with interrogatory. Just not necessary. And, if they, and, and I've actually said, to, I've said it in jest to people, not at a real hearing, but I've said to people, that's my attitude. If you want to do depositions, I'm not putting it in the order. You go ahead and do as many as you want. Don't tell me about it. I don't want to know about it. You're just wasting your client's money. So that's my view. Um, we can talk about more about why it's efficient to do it that way. We also see practitioners when we give them all of these, all of these lessons and all these best practices, and they have different page witness statements from which to cross examine the witnesses. We still don't know how to cross examine them, especially in the deposition and arbitration. You can't teach a committee to be a lawyer. But you can disabuse them of, 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 of notions they have about it, how an arbitration should be. Great. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. Okay, so the next uh, CLE word for the uh, virtual world is... David? Arbitration. Got it. <laughs> Great. Okay, it's arbit arbitration is the next CLE word. I for the for the virtual world, we have uh, 99 people out there in the virtual world. Thank you for showing up. I just want to give a shout out to the AAA folks that are online today from around the country. Uh, Monzi Carroll, Lisa Romeo, Christina Ryan, and Narissa Diaz-Mosen. Uh, thank you guys for joining us tonight. So, Reka, you got the next question. I, I really just want to note the, the subtle branding that's happening here. American arbitration. We have done our CLEs very well here. Moving along. So our next topic is one about rule amendments. We see through rule amendments how our practice evolves in arbitration. Often there's a set of years um, from which we learn from and look back to. And so the rules from 2013 were amended in 2022, a little bit less than 10 years at the AAA. Looking back, taking stock, a two-year process that involved not only those within the AAA and ICDR, but also scholars and academics, practitioners, and other thought leaders to help ensure that the rules really captured the practice as it stands as of September 2022 with all sorts of commentary. And so what we're going to do now is take a look at those rules. We're going to look at and ask our erudite speakers what, what they like and perhaps even what they don't like but also what's to come down the turnpike, right? What may incorporate in due course by quick reference, things that got incorporated into these commercial rules include things that were part of other practices like the construction arbitration rules, consolidation and joinder, confidentiality, just even more clearly defined and even collegiality, right? So with that, we're gonna turn to our speakers and take a look at it, but we're gonna hobnob a bit. And so we're not just going down the line and back this way. What we'll do is this, if you'll allow me speakers, we'll go Leslie, Dana, and David, then Steve, Rich, and Richard. And we end with Richard with the last word on rules amendments. Great. If Leslie. I can just add one thing. It, <laughs> it took two years for AAA to put together these updated rules. We brought together users, uh, our board members, arbitrators. That was not listening to me when I gave you that introduction after two years. <laughs> but it took two years. It was it was a big process uh, at, at AAA. We don't do this every, very often. Uh, and these are the gold standard standard rules. So I will turn it back over to you, Rekha. Sorry. No, no, to Leslie, please. So I'll have to remember that I'm going first. That's good. <laughs> Everyone else has to pay attention. Um, so you're going to bear with me because I forgot my glasses. So in terms of the, uh, the amended rules, um, and Rekha, I'm assuming you want me to go through the ones that I like, as opposed to, or we're, gonna, we're not going rule by rule, correct? Uh, we're not going rule by rule only because I don't think um, that may help. But, but what would be good is, yes, what do you like about the amended rules? What are okay. you seeing that's so helping process? 
So, you know, I, and I've, I've sort of picked a couple of them in order, and it's not that I, I have particularly favorites, I just highlighted some. So, um, but, you know, and, and starting from the top. So, you know, one of the things uh, when we amended them, or when, when AAA amended them, um, you know, we took the dollar amount or, or we took the dollar amount for the large complex case and we sort of, we sort of bumped it a bit. Um, and one of the things that I think was important to notice, it, you know, it's always hard to change a dollar amount, um, but I think there's a recognition that, you know, let's be clear um, what constitutes a large case. I mean, I think you could almost, you know, bump it even higher in some respects, because especially from where we're sitting, and I think we talked about this at another uh, CLE, I think I forgot where it was. We did. At your office, but, I think. But yeah. yeah, but you could talk about the fact that what constitutes, you know, large and complex and, and, and where you pick your threshold, um, you know, you really, um, you really could move these, um, you know, at, at a different level. Um, and Leslie, and, forgive me, let's just set some um, boundary lines here. So the floor for what it used to be under the 2013 sort of rules? 2013 rules for a uh, large complex case or for? We went from 75 to- Oh, expedite, expedite, I'm sorry, 75,000 to 100,000. To 100,000. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, you know- It went from the, yeah, 1 million to 3 million for what we deemed to be an LCC case. Right. Which I think it should, like we talked about, I think it should be higher in this part of the country. But, you know, AAA is a, a large company and we have 26 offices. So we have to take that into consideration. We have to take that into consideration. And of course, in some respects, you also have to consider the fact that, you know, it's a little bit of a tension there because in some respects, you could have things that are complicated and the, the dollar amount could be lower. But, but when you factor in New York and when you factor in, and I guess you get weighted down by the rest of the country, but, but some of this does, does sort of distort it a bit. So I think it was, it was good to adjust it. And to recognize that dollar amounts really should have shifted, um, and it was about time to adjust it a bit and recognize it that way. So I think that that was the way to go. Um, also, um, and, and I don't know how. I mean, granted, it took time to make some of these changes, and I don't know that all of this was necessarily driven, um, you know, by COVID. Um, but you know, recognizing that we have the ability to um, use, so looking at the rules that talk about the use of video audio, other electronic measures or other electronic means to deal with proceedings and being able to be more facile with the way that we conduct our proceedings. Um, and so, um, and we had talked about this recently, I think actually, Rich, we talked about this in context of something else. You know, there was a point in time that you were only able to do, if you weren't all physically present, um, your only option was originally audio just to hear people. Um, and now, now we're opening up and being able to see people by Zoom and being able to see people um, and being able to recognize that it's okay to conduct all of these hearings and procedures in a variety of different measures. Um, and while some of us have preferences on how we're conducting things, and maybe we all want to be in person for certain events and we'd like to maybe, um, you know, have more flexibility, um, I think by by having everything incorporated in the rules and expanding the ability for certain procedures to definitely recognize that you can um, expand different procedures on different different platforms also allows you to incorporate um, other people recognize that in certain instances you have different economic um, status for people allow other witnesses to participate whereas um, they might not otherwise have been able to come into a proceeding. Um, and so expanding some of that and letting, whether it's the arbitrator or the parties, uh, be more diverse in who's being included in some of these proceedings is, is very helpful. I personally like, and I've been adopting it much more, um, even at the initial stages um, of even my preliminary being able to see people if they're, if not everybody's in New York and I don't always want to drag everybody into as lovely as AAA is, let's be very clear, we love the headquarters and all of that. But I like to, I don't want to use loop up to just listen to people even at the initial conference. I want to see people. Some of it's just because I want to recognize who I'm talking to. It gets very confusing when it's, you know, let's be clear, three guys on the phone and me, I, I know who I am, um, but, you know, just to discern voices and recognize, and I think you get better attention, better focus. Um, so even the ability to 
you know, bring in people and see people along those lines. Um, Rich, you covered already one of the things that I liked, which was uh, in the dispositive motion. Um, that was one that I had flagged the amendment to rule 34, that you're able to recognize the, uh, the cost saving measure, um, the time and cost associated with bringing a dispositive motion. Um, I actually had a hearing today on something um, where the parties had raised the ability to file a dispositive motion. Um, it would have been a letter request, and we actually ended up having a conversation, deciding to do it as a docs only hearing, resolve the matter that way, because it made no sense to seek permission to file a dispositive motion when they really were at the stage that it just could be decided on documents. It would have been a wasted it just it was a wasted step to decide whether or not to bring a dispositive motion. They completed discovery already. Just give me the documents, let's make a decision. What are we, what are we making a dispositive motion? The likelihood of maybe not having it granted under that standard made no sense as opposed to just having a decision rendered. Um, and after a discussion that made a lot more sense and the parties agree. Um, the recognition in the form of the award under rule 48, I'm squinting here, so hopefully I'm getting the rule right. Um, allowing an arbitrator to sign electronically as opposed to the wet signature, you know, occasionally having been several years ago where I had to worry about printing out my award and finding a place to print it while I'm on the road, put a wet signature, scan the darn thing, whereas I can put an electronic signature on an award um, is a recognition of where we are in the state of the world. Um, and that we can do it that way. And thank you for you know, making that change to recognize that not everybody's sitting there with a printer and a scanner and all of that. So um, some of this I think is just changing on how we practice. Um, so I'm not sure where I am time-wise. I have you, others that I like. But. Yeah, we're gonna leave because there weren't so many rule amendments. So we'll leave some. I'm gonna new. leave some for other people. <laughs> so leave. I just picked some. There are plenty of others I like and appreciate, but I just grabbed We'll some. get to the ones they dislike too. Thank you, Leslie, so much. When that was brought up, I would bring that up. Five, oh. 500,000. Do you want to bring it up? Because yeah, it's, that's why there was 500. 500,000. Yeah. Yeah. Someone brought it up that it was five, not 1 million to 3 million for LCC it went from 500,000 to 1 million, to, uh, you know, to 3 million, excuse me, I keep on saying these numbers wrong. <laughs> okay. But sorry. No, no, but they're, they're codified in your rule books and this, these thresholds, I think just demonstrate, right. When you get into the LCC territory, you're up to three arbitrators. And there was some commentary about that too. What does the threshold mean? Why does it change and what powers does it grant? Just also a quick note from what Leslie said about this idea that we can be flexible using online means. It's not that the rules and most rules in, in our marketplace, arbitral rules, they never prevented the use of video conference, right? They never explicitly said it necessarily if you chart rule to rule across arbitral institutions. And so codifying it into the rules to say, yes, it's possible, the pandemic being the greatest advert, let's say, for arbitration, domestic or international, as national courts closed, it really taught us we have a dexterity. We just have to keep remembering to use it regularly. <laughs> With, it was, to it that was more being just for overt as opposed to... Yeah. In, and we're seeing that in, the, in many rules across arbitral institutions, because often the reaction was, we never said it couldn't be done. Sure. So let's just be clear and say it outright. You know, to that point, and Leslie, if people at your firm brought this up, maybe it was you that said a lot of these things that you know we put into the rules in 2022 already existed at AAA, but now you as counsel or as an arbitrator can now point to these rules because they've existed. I would say many of these rules that we're talking about tonight already existed in policy at AAA, but you had to call up the case manager and say, well, what's the policy at AAA? And that, was, and, just, and that was some of the problem was because then you had a distinction. You had people saying, well, I don't see it anywhere. So being able to point to it made it a lot easier to say, but it's here now. Yeah, It's there, especially when you had a disagreement between the parties or counsel going, I don't see it anywhere. I don't know how you can allow me. And when they're disagreeing about something, it's a lot easier to point to a rule and say, but rule so-and-so or such and such says X, this is what I'm relying on. Um, and it makes it a lot easier as an arbitrator or as an advocate, advocate yeah. to point to something. So clarifying it is what I mean, you know, allowing us to be helpful. At. Yeah, I'm hearing it more from advocates that they love the new rules because they can point to things now and say to the arbitrators, well, this is where it's at. So, Dana, if you would seize the mic next. Our order again just goes in its happenstance order. Leslie to Dana to David to Steve to Rich to Richard. 
So I, I agree with um, what's been said, and there have been a number of rules. I'm going to definitely save some of the key rule amendments for others to comment on. Um, but I do think that it sort of echoes what I think everyone has said, that the amendments really are, in some respects, like codifying what was already practiced and making clear to council and arbitrators um, that this is how we're doing it now and you have something to point to. And so it's really responsive to what the parties and council were asking for. Um, and so, uh, you know, with that, I'll just, I think that the clarity on dispositive motions is, is very helpful that it gives the arbitrators an additional tool on that. Um, I think that the revisions to the consolidation and joinder uh, provision are, are good ones. I know somebody else wants to speak on that, so I'm going to pass. I'll just um, highlight that the, um, the checklist for arbitrators with respect to um, asking various questions of council at, at the preliminary hearing now includes um, asking about third party funding. I think that was something that was done far less frequently than maybe some of the other things that were codified in the rules. And so I really like that this has been added as someone who was in the funding industry and knows how important it is for there to be disclosure of funding. So now arbitrators are. Yeah, there was no policy at AAA when we put that in there. However, a lot of arbitrators were doing it. And we, yeah, exactly. So now I think even more, if not all, we'll yep. do it. And exactly. That's, that's a great thing. Um, and, uh, and so with that, I'm conscious of time and I am going to turn it over to the next person. I don't, don't remember who that is. David. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can't wait. American arbitration. <laughs> okay, oh, actually you can David, you can do it now. Is it what, time? What, yes. Okay. I'd like to advise you all in the ethosphere that it's association is the third word association for the all right. Carrot in the chat guessed it right. Well done. Well done. We're charting here. Okay, so let me just uh, let me just I think clarify something with regard to the thresholds, the monetary thresholds. I think the um, the in, the the threshold for large complex commercial procedures, I think, was increased from five hundred thousand to one million dollars. But the issue with three million, I think, was that the minimum claim or counterclaim amount for a panel of three arbitrators was increased from. 1 million to 3 million. And I like that very much as someone who has sat on tribunals where the amount in question was a million dollars or a little over a million dollars. And it really didn't seem uh, very efficient, very cost efficient, because my experience is that the cost of having three arbitrators on a panel is more, ends up being more than three times the cost of having one arbitrator. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand why, but part of all, all the discussions and interaction and doing and redoing and reviewing, uh, it becomes more expensive. So I'm very glad that that threshold was raised. Um, I have a different view on the third party funding thing, which I'm glad you raised and I had a feeling you would, but I don't, uh, that's not something that I ask and, and I'm not sure uh, the utility of it. it. It raises to me, it raises raises issues where there aren't any. I don't ask you know, what the insurance companies are for parties. Uh, and I don't ask about third party funders, but um, because that generally doesn't become known to me. So why would I look into that? But I'm happy to discuss that further and hear why I'm wrong on that. Um, one, one other amendment that hasn't been mentioned yet relates to modification of the award, where previously, the ability to mod modify a, a final award uh, was limited to uh, making clerical, typographical, or comp computational corrections if there were errors. And that's very, very narrow because the status of an arbitrator, once you've rendered a final award, is functo officio, you're, you're done. You have no further authority. And with, with, uh, with the exception of those, very, very limited exceptions. So now uh, rule 52 is updated to allow an arbitrator upon a party's request to quote unquote interpret the award, which means I think if it's not clear, 
to the parties, or if, if it's not clear, or it's ambiguous, you can clarify what you've written. You can't change what you've written. You can't change your decision. You can't um, change your analysis. But uh, I know we're going on and off. Um, but you can interpret it for clarification purposes. I know there have been were a number of cases where um, the parties and the arbitrators were kind of stuck in this never never land where there was a lack of clarity, but the uh, the arbitrator couldn't really do anything about it because of the 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 way the prior provision was worded. So um, that's it. I, I don't want to repeat the others. I, I agree that the other rule changes are good. The um, uh, the motion to dismiss uh, the uh, clarify it, it clarifies confidentiality obligations, uh, memorializes that. It uh, makes clarification about dispositive motions, which we've heard about. Uh, they've also added a, um, a five-day period upon receipt of um, uh, post-hearing submissions for the arbitrations to officially close the arbitration. And I think that's probably a good idea that was subject to some wiggle room that, that could be potentially abused or taken advantage of by arbitrators who just wanted more and more time. And in the interest of keeping the, the process on track, uh, I think it was a good idea to put a, a time limit on closing the hearings once you, once the arbitrators know that they have everything that they need to render an award. Steve, you're up. All right, I'll Thanks, pick David. up with what David was talking about because um, I don't want to repeat all of the rules, but um, I'll push back a little bit with David on the funding. Um, I had an experience under the old rules um, where nobody talked about it. And during cross-examination of the claimant's principal at the merits hearing, one of the cross-examination questions is, how do you afford, how do you afford to bring this case? Your company has ceased operations. I don't know if I can answer that question. And the lawyer says, I instruct you not to answer. You're under an obligation of confidentiality. And I said, what do you mean? Are you talking about funding? Yeah, we have a fund, but I can't talk about it. So anyway, we, I basically had to wing it at the moment and say, look, I mean, you need to tell the other side and me the name of the funder. I don't care what the funding arrangement is. It's not relevant to me, but for disclosure purposes. So it was a good idea to get these things out of, out, you know, in that case, it didn't matter because I didn't have any relationship with the funder, but for it to come up at, the, at that later stage for the first time is not a, not a good practice. So getting it up front, like anything else that you need to clear out of the way, I think is a good one. The other, my favorite rule is the one that David wrote, um, <laughs> changed, the one David brought up, which is 52 which allows now arbitrators in AAA commercial rules for the first time, the ability to interpret an award, meaning if the award is ambiguous or, or maybe didn't deal with something fully and the parties wanna know what the, what the consequences are. Um, yes, that can be abused and I bet it will be and people are gonna wind up making uh, um, uh, applications to interpret perfectly clear awards and maybe arbitrator will have to spend a little more time saying the same thing over again, but there are cases in my, my role at Practical Law, I track cases. There's a case that came out a few years ago called Smarter Tools, where there was an ambiguity in the award and, and there was nothing the arbitrator can do about it. It went all the way up to the Second Circuit. Uh, the Second Circuit remanded to go back to the arbitrator to do it again and clarify the, the award, which he did. And then it went back to the district court and back to the Second Circuit again. And so the courts have always had the power to remand for clarification. So if the courts can do it, why, you know, why shouldn't the, the arbitrators be able to do it uh, on request? So I think that's a good rule. That's Thanks, it. Steve. <laughs> Rich, you're up next. So generally speaking, I think the amendments are great. Um, and I, at the risk of beating a dead horse, I do want to make one further comment about new rule 34 about dispositive motions, because I think it's historically been the case that uh, arbitrators back in the day would never entertain a dispositive motion. They didn't think it was appropriate to deprive a party of a hearing. And then the rule was placed in the commercial rules that you could make a dispositive motion, but you had to show that the motion was likely to succeed and that it would narrow or dispose of the issues in the case. And I think most of us have found over the last number of years that that permission to 
speak to make a dispositive motion was being invoked too often. And it's hard for me to think back on many cases that I've handled over the last, at least the last decade, in which there has not been a request for a dispositive motion. It seems like every case there is a request for a dispositive motion. And it's gotten to the point where it just made no sense because you have to figure that when you permit a dispositive motion, you're adding two, two and a half, three months to the schedule between the time that it takes to make the application for permission, the opposition to that application, the arbitrator's determination of whether to allow the motion to be filed, then full briefing on the motion, and then, of course, deliberations on the motion. Before you know it, it's two to three months. And sometimes you get these motions filed, and the hearing is a two-day hearing. So what are you accomplishing by spending an enormous amount of money to make a dispositive motion when you can try the whole case in two days? So now I'm delighted to see that Rule 34B gives us the discretion to say it doesn't make sense from a timing point of view and from a cost point of view. There's still room for the dispositive motion that is appropriate um, and will really save time at a, what would otherwise be a long hearing. And I think that strikes the right balance. Uh, David briefly mentioned confidentiality. I like this one very much because I think lawyers, even very good lawyers, have a misunderstanding sometimes with regard to whether arbitrations are confidential. You know, if you read the mainstream press, uh, you would think that every arbitration takes place in a secret room uh, and, and nothing can be disclosed. Well, that's just not true. Uh, the fact of the matter is that arbitration is private, but it is not confidential inherently. Now, all of us arbitrators, we have an ethical obligation not to, dis to disclose anything that occurs in the arbitration. And that's uh, by virtue of these standards that I mentioned earlier, and also the code of ethics for arbitrators and commercial disputes. But the parties are not bound to keep things confidential unless they agree. That was the rule. And I have made it a practice over the course of the last number of years to point that out at the preliminary hearing. And sometimes you get raised eyebrows about that. And the parties say, well, can we, can we agree that it'll be confidential? And I say, absolutely, just present me with a stipulation. I'll so order it. Now, rule 24 has been expanded. And it now provides, among other things, <clears throat> that the arbitrator in order to achieve a fair, efficient, and economical resolution of the case can do the following, including without limitation, subdivision E, issuing any other enforcement orders which the arbitrator is empowered to issue under applicable law. That gives enormous discretion to the arbitrator. And one of the things that the arbitrator can do is order that the proceedings be confidential. Now, you wouldn't want to do that if there was some reason why a party had a legitimate interest in the arbitration not being confidential, but it would have to be a special case, I would think. Um, another rule that has been mentioned is Rule 8, uh, which is, I think, a major addition. It involves consolidation and joinder. There wasn't any previous rule to address this. You would have situations where there would be related arbitrations that would be pending separately before different arbitrators involving overlapping issues and parties. And there was no mechanism to address it. I believe that rule eight, which is a long rule, probably got more attention than virtually anything else in the amendments. Uh, because it is so detailed. And if you get around to it, take a look 
and you'll see that there is now a provision for the appointment of a joinder arbitrator just to deal with these kinds of applications. As a matter of fact, on Monday, I'm going to be having a joinder hearing. This is my sole function in this arbitration, to serve as the joinder arbitrator, to decide whether a bunch of non-signatories to the agreement should be added to the arbitration. And once I make that decision, I'm done. It goes back to whatever arbitrator is assigned to the merits. One other thing that I would uh, add, and this is a, a very much under the radar amendment, which I have not seen discussed anywhere. So there is a provision, there's always has been a provision on postponements. And the old rules, the 2013 rules provided, and I, I'm not remembering the exact language, but it basically said that the parties can agree to extend period. And I had parties quoting that when they agreed to modify the hearing dates. One of the things that we all do at the beginning of a hearing, at the beginning of a case, is we tell the parties once those hearing dates are set, they are inviolate. Unless there is something truly compelling, we're not moving the hearing dates. If you want to adjust some of the pre-hearing deadlines, that's fine, but not the hearing dates. Well, that sentence in the, in, in the prior rule that you could extend by agreement any date was being uh, invoked by parties to say, well, we're not ready for the hearing. We want to kick it over three months. So there has been a subtle change uh, in that rule. I probably can't put my finger on it right now, but the rule now says the parties may modify, and this is rule 43, the parties may modify by mutual agreement any period of time established by these rules or the party's arbitration agreement. Now that's a lot narrower than simply saying may modify any date because a, an arbitrator's case management plan is not a period of the time established by these rules. And it's not a period of time established by the party's arbitration agreement. So I think that the drafters had this in mind to kind of close this loophole that seemed to exist uh, with respect to giving the party's discretion to modify any date, including hearing dates. Thanks, Rich. I want to drop a footnote here to go back to just the point Rich made about confidentiality that David raised as well, and as well consolidation and joinder. It is of utmost importance that when you get a moment, you parse through the actual rules that exist. The AAA commercial rules is what we're talking about, because the rules do differ institution to institution, even as it pertains to confidentiality. And so to know the rubric of what you're under, but separately, under the construction AAA rules, joinder and consolidation always existed. Rule seven, appointment of what Rich is doing right now. We realized the importance of it in the commercial rules. And so the AAA thoughtfully did incorporate them and codified their width. But sometimes people will ask the question, why do you choose a particular set of rules within our arbitration clause? Do we leave it up to the institution to figure it out for us, depending on what that case seems like it may be? Real estate, that sort of encumbers both construction and commercial. And so being particular about how you pick the rules and what the rules actually say in their amended form as it stands now becomes of utmost importance. With that, Richard, we go to you. <laughs> With apologies to Richard, if I could just put in a plug for the app. Oh, yes. Um, oh, yes. It, it's fantastic. If you don't have it, there's an app that you can download from you know, Google Play or the uh, or, or the Apple Store. Um, it has all of the AAA rules. And you don't have to lug this around or if you forget it, you just look on your phone and you'll have access to every set of rules. It's terrific. Well, 
Um, I think all the bases have been covered and very well. Uh, so I won't, and I won't try to revisit. I agree with everything that's been said and learned a few things today. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I have uh, just a couple of comments. On consolidation and joinder, it's true that the construction rules have, have had that since time immemorial, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also true that the international rules have had them yep. since at least the 2014 revision. And if you notice, we never do our rules at the same time. No. We do ICDR at a different time and then construction, commercial, so we can look at the employment rules at what we've done in other divisions and learn from them. And we've learned commercial, we've learned from construction. Yep. And it's a learning process and the rules get done and redone to, at different times. This has been a big, long time gap, though, in the commercial rules, as it's been, we've had it in international, which usually follows, I, in my experience, commercial rules. This time, the commercial rules are following, you know, uh, chronologically following the, the, uh, the uh, international rules. Um, and that's great. It's one of those great things that we really needed to have. I happen to question the idea of, of allowing the um, one of the arbitrators who's already been appointed in one of the cases, in the case of consolidation, to decide the consolidation question as opposed to, which is a, a, another approach that's allowed, AAA can, can uh, go about it that way. Um, because I think the, the arbitrators who are already appointed have vested interest, either to keep the case or to unload the case if they don't want the case anymore. Um, either way, I think it's much better to to have, uh, it's not always practical, I suppose. These, these don't have to be very lengthy hearings. So I doubt that Rich's hearing is gonna go on for more than a week or so. Um, <laughs> be, uh, number, of hours. number of hours, exactly. But it's, it's an expense to tie, tee it up and get the arbitrator appointed and counsel to get ready for it. But I think it's much better to have someone who doesn't have, um, um, any any sort of interest in the in the result, uh, deciding it whenever possible. Uh, Rule thirty three C. I'd like to point out, this is on allowing testimony to go forward in something other than in person. It's a great change. But there's an interesting part about uh, this language, which is that it says that it, the ar arbitrators are authorized to allow some or all of the testimony. Um, or evidence to, to be received other than in person. The, I can see the argument coming down that it can only be done if the parties ask for it. You know, and I, I think arbitrators should have the latitude to direct it, even if the parties don't want to um, proceed remotely. You know, and I think the use of the word allow there suggests that somebody has to ask for it, right? Um, and confidentiality is the last comment I'll make. I agree with everything that's been said about it. Um, but I think the, really re the real reason why it's great is that it comports with party expectations. It comports with what parties, when they entered into the arbitration clause, thought arbitration was going to be like. And it comports more often than not with what the lawyers uh, expect when the arbitration is actually starting. Uh, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a very important point. Certainly at the time that they're entering into the contract, those commercial, you know, the contract lawyers who are putting the arbitration clause don't have in mind the subtle distinction that we've been working with for so many years uh, between arbitration being private and arbitration being confidential. No, no one has that distinction in mind in the commercial world. The expectation is that arbitration would be confidential. Some of the other providers and the institutional rules um, have provided for a long time for confidentiality. And I think this is a great thing that the AAA has adopted this as well. Um, uh, thoughtful of time. What I did want to just add upon and ask for some input generally without naming off people to respond on it. Um, so I'll, I'll pose sort of two questions if you've seen it in practice to our speakers and then one looking down the turnpike. The, the two questions, the first of it is this. So AAA introduced by way of practice, uh, the streamlined process whereby the parties appoint um, all three arbitrators, whether it's party appointed or it's by the list, 
And then the two wing arbitrators can fall away through the initial processes, rejoining at the hearing stage or right prior to the hearing stage to be part of the proceedings in the hearing therewith, but that the tribunal chair could decide all initial issues that come before it, whether they're about discovery, that faded word, or many other things in terms of process moving the timeline along. The wing stayed involved in correspondence as needed, but didn't really weigh in. And so my question comes by way of setting a broad background. Have any of you seen this in practice? And if you have um, comments on it, and even if you haven't, if you'd like to comment on, on the process itself. So Leslie, I'm seeing some nods, please. I've seen it not as an arbitrator. I've seen it as chair of my uh, DR practice at my firm. It's been implemented in two cases that we have and the feedback um, there was a discussion by a couple of my advocates because it was one of the first times they've seen it. Um, and so I, I can only tell you right now, it's sort of midway through two of the cases. Um, one of it was presented to the advocates. Um, there's nobody on this panel that is involved in it. So I'll flag that just for whatever it's worth. Um, but but there, there was a concern. The first was it was presented as an option and there was a concern, gee, will the wings be upset if they avail themselves of it. I said, you know, my, my view is, look, it's being presented as an option. It's something you can pick and they should not be upset. It's an option. You have a cost saving measures, take advantage of it and use it. Um, and um, because the obligation to our client is to take advantage of something that we can save a measure of it. Um, and if the panel is putting it forth and that it's available, et cetera, please use it. Um, so it remains to be seen. I think it's something that if you can do it and the circumstance is right, it makes sense. Um, in the other case, it was sort of put in a hybrid approach with the ability to call them back if necessary, if the if the case sort of, um, for lack of a better word, riles up, if things got out of control, if they felt that um, they just they were discovery disputes or things took a certain turn, you could pull them in. And I think the order is being drafted in such a way that that it you know there was some some sort of trigger provisions or something like that. So it's newer and it's being implemented, but I'm sort of watching it closely. But I've been become much more aware of it and it's a topic of discussion. I think if used appropriately, it only can add for an economic um, result uh, in the right case. Any other comments, Steve and then Rich? So I've had it um, once. Um, nobody knew what it meant or why it was in the clause. Mm -hmm. And the chair said, look, um, if I need my co-arbitrators, I'm gonna call my co-arbitrators regardless of what the clause says. In that case, the parties played pretty well and there wasn't a whole lot of need for any. For, for, for significant pre-hearing uh, procedures, but I think the, the, the I think the, the the rule is flawed because it, it's assuming that the case is going to proceed like a domestic civil litigation where they, you're off doing your prep stuff without the tribunal, and maybe you'll have a discovery master for something, and then you'll deal with the merits at the trial. But in arbitration, and especially international arbitration, it's an it's a process. There's a first written submission, then there's a response, and then there's a, then there's the rejoinder, and there are issues coming up throughout the process before the final merits hearing. And to shut the two of the three arbitrators out of that makes no sense to me at all. Well, I take a view. Um, I've been involved in both that the AAA offers. There's a B. Yep. Uh, What happens is that the arbitrator is not involved in the matter until and they are brought up to speed when the round begins. Option B, the traders are not even selected until very close to the hearing. I've been involved in three option A, which I have been the chair, so I've been alone until a month before the hearing. And I think it was very efficient. Um, I think if I had been a wing, I might have also, obviously because I not I've been aware of what's been going on and and you're like drinking from my fire to the case in order to be prepared. But what I would say, Rika, is that even if you do not invoke one of those procedures, I think this goes on in practice all the time. Uh, I'm I've had many many panels, uh, both in which I've served as chair and wing in which the panel offers to the parties the possibility of the chair serving discovery referee, if you 
uh, nine of the time, discovery issues do not level that they require three arbitrators to decide. And the process of getting three arbitrators together, having them read what, what some joint submissions that go on for you know, 20, 30 pages, and then to deliberate over issues which are which one arbitrator can handle without very much difficulty, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, I do the same thing or that, that Steve, that is, even if the parties on with the notion of having arbitrator deal with discovery, uh, what generally provide is that parties decide that they want with respect to a particular app that all three are participate then all three parties traders will participate uh, and if the arbitrator wants the input of the others on a discovery issue that could be dispositive potentially that shall happen so doing a quick mic change for those remote. So I think that practical uh, result does give you the best of both worlds. It, it allows you to save time and expense, uh, but uh, allows the arbitrators and allows the parties to get everybody involved if the particular issue merits. Richard? So I think these are very different uh, experiences, I, because in my experience, when they, and I, I haven't been involved in two out of three scenarios, the multiple times where the chair, either with me as the chair or as a wing, um, has been delegated the discovery function. And my experience, the chair uh, tends to keep the other two arbitrators generally informed of what's going on, um, and that's fine. Um, and I've had an experience, it can be very efficient. Uh, and I've had an experience or two where uh, I, I came in at the end, later in the, was actually appointed after the preliminaries. And I have to say that was a blast. I mean, to come into a case and actually only have to deal with the merits uh, after it's, the case has been well teed up was really a lot of fun. Um, so I'll take those appointments anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming the person, the chair knows what she or he is doing, which is, you know, usually not always the case with a trained AAA panel um, arbitrator. Thank you for that. One other question we're going to go to. Um, it's just a means to say, right, again, that rules amendments don't exist in a silo. The practice evolves as well by each institution and the practices they implement. So this is one of AAAs that even when I was at the AAA, I found it innovative but curious, did anyone use it? And at the time I was there, it had just been introduced. And so the answer was no, not yet, but stay tuned. So you've just heard it here. The other question I wanted to go to as we think about um, the ethos in total of how rules and practice evolve together is we are in an era of code evolution, code of conduct or codes of conduct for arbitrators. And I just wanted to get um, the panel's input on this. Um, and I think Rich sort of teed it up in the beginning when he said you received uh, an email docusign, I will affirm these tenants, I hereby will honor them. Does a process like that, inclusive of a set of rules, a code of conduct imposed on the arbitrators, um, in truth, that award, if it becomes um, thorny, may come out in vacature set aside or any other things late in later stages, but notwithstanding, um, is it effective, but even more so, takes on these codes? Because the big question we often say is, if it's not anchored to an institution, what is enforcement? Is it just our own morality sense? But any, any comments on the codes at large before we move into our other very hot topics? I think this is a very reputational based activity that we're engaged in as arbitrators. And I think if you don't, you don't comply with those basic tenets, you know, word will get out. <laughs> that, uh, you won't be doing this for much longer. So I think that's, I think that ultimately the market will uh, uh, take care of the problem. I mean, I just add that, you know, it's, uh, as Rich mentioned, it was just today that it was circulated and um, there was really nothing particularly controversial about it. I mean, it's basically memorializing or 
signing on to a statement that confirms uh, the standards that we already adhere to. So, um, I mean, I didn't find anything controversial. So, it, I don't know that it changes any of our behavior, it just confirms in writing uh, standards that we adhere to. If I may jump back in, I think, I think there's a benefit in having people read them every year and be reminded what they are. Uh, and I think it's, it's a good process. A larger question, have they been amended? Do they change? We'll get to that at another time, but notwithstanding. Um, thank you. For, Rich, you wanted to add in? Yeah, please? I, I want to second what Richard said, because I think that those standards are anchoring. Uh, what's notable to me is uh, that the AAA in assembling these standards also includes as footnotes uh, those particular standards that you can now know where to go. And frankly, um, and this is not a, an issue of fault, many arbitrators are not aware of the code of ethics for arbitrators in commercial disputes because it's not something that arises uh, in most instances. And just to be reminded of it, that it is the source material that you should go to, uh, I think is a benefit. AAA was one of the leaders in introducing this code, which it cited to a lot. So that's why I raise it, because the truth is, in many instances, reputational damage is what you create. So getting more appointments, if you violate the codes of conduct, certainly would be a bad thing for you and your business. But notwithstanding, much like when we had to take an ethics uh, exam as part of our um, doctrinal territory in passing the bar. <laughs> there are minimum standards. I wanted to give the mic to Jeff for a moment because he had some rules updates that he was ferociously writing I, down he wanted to share with you. Before I do that, I have to do the last CLE word or name. It is Peter. I think he stepped out for a second, but our, our great host. So it's American. The first one's American Arbitration Association. And the last one for the audience in the virtual world is Peter. Okay, so thank you. Yeah, actually, I had someone made a comment about, uh, well, I'll get to that next, but uh, strike limits. Uh, I want to talk to you guys about that. Put on your hat as advocates, not as arbitrators. In the new rules uh, or the updated rules, of September 2022, we put a provision in there where we can limit strikes, AAA, as the administrator. What are your thoughts as an advocate for that? So after one list goes out, it's a strike and rank list, and let's say both sides are striking a lot of people, okay, because we don't usually put limits on that, and we can't come up with a tribunal. At that point, the AAA does have the authority under the new rules to administratively appoint. I'll tell you my opinion about that after, but I want to hear what your opinion is as advocates. Anybody have thoughts on that? Richard nodding your head. Yeah, I, I applaud that. You do? Uh, okay. I do, because I think this is one of the areas that parties can manipulate. Um, I've seen it happen. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer in a very big firm, and uh, I get asked frequently to look at a list and I generally know many people on the list. Um, and yet, when the list is turned in uh, by both parties, uh, nobody is acceptable. Um, that can't be. How could nobody be acceptable? So I think uh, that is often done for the purpose of delay, and that should not be encouraged. So the AAA spends a lot of time assembling um, lists um, 10, 15, 20 on a list. Uh, they are diverse. Uh, they're increasingly diverse. And it seems to me that the case managers do a great job of trying to assemble people who have background in the area. Uh, they look at the resumes of the, uh, of the roster members and they learn administratively at the administrative conference uh, what kind of an arbitrator, what experience level the arbitrator should have. So when all of that effort is brought to bear and you get lists that contain, you know, nine out of 10 strikes, uh, it seems to me that that goes too far and that the AAA needs to step in and do precisely what has been done here. Thank you. Steve? The AAA no. for years have been more creative than that, at least the good case managers. Yes, sir. They're all good case managers. Well, that, some, that, some are more proactive and they suggest, well, why don't uh, you claim it? Uh, give me five names. Why don't yep. you respond and give me five names? And then the AAA will put five names and put them together on a list of sure. 15. You're not going to have everyone stricken on a list like that. In that farming case that you had recently, you yep. put together, um, um, you got the parties, gave them access to, to, to the entire database, come up with some names, interview some people. Sure. What, once you start working with people, they can be cooperative. If, they, if, if you Mike. give them this and allow them to try it, 
then you know people are going to strike. No, I agree with you, and I, I agree with Rich. I mean, if the parties are abusing it, I like the fact that the AAA has the authority to step in. But I, I, it is the party's process, and I like them to have the say over who they can select for an arbitrator. So I'll try to be as, cre as creative as possible. So will I encourage my team of case managers to be. Rich? Yeah. So, Richard. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, uh, I think this is a complicated issue. Once you, once you put a numerical limit on the number of strikes, I think there needs to be some flexibility because sometimes the strikes are based upon actual conflicts. Sure. Right. And uh, maybe it can be two different kinds of strikes as there, as there are in jury selection, you know, where one is, one is for cause and one is for, I just don't like the tie he's wearing. Yep. Um, and um, I think uh, there are some cases where, especially if you have big firms or, Big companies, you know, they're going to have some serious, serious number of, of strikes for, for good cause. Sure, right? uh, but I suspect that if there were strikes for good cause based on conflicts, that could be brought to the attention of the case manager, and I very much doubt that the AAA would punish parties that you're correct showed good cause for why the list yeah, if, is if, not if, if we see good cause then we'll uh, supplement the list uh but yeah you're uh, richard to your point kind of I mean, mechanism. You just, you, instead of just striking it you know you asterisk it yeah you have an explanation here this, this is good cause and then someone will follow up if you're if you're going if you see yourself as a party council going beyond the limit sure right, and that's the reason you should be able to trigger an opportunity to have that conversation. I think that's a really good point, Richard, also as to the rules are the rules, vaguely scoped, but evolving to get us to our best practice. But it cannot be without an institution buttressing it. You have to go to the institution to figure out those creative ways sometimes. And I think that's not always obvious that you could pick up the phone and call your case manager or the lead VP of that division. But we're in alternative dispute resolution, right? So that's part of the process. It has to be a limit, right? Yep. Um, one other thing on the rules, the, uh, the emergency arbitration provision, someone asked about that. I know some of you have been emergency arbitrators on this panel. If you can just quickly explain that. And then also my question is, how do you like the cost shifting part that we added in there? That was something that we added in. I, I like it a lot, uh, that we can cost shift for an emergency arbitrator. And by way of background, the question on emergency arbitration came up when we were having the conversation on joinder and consolidation. So if there are any parallels you think erudite to share, do that as well. But the question is emergency arbitration, process, cost shifting, any other parallels within the rules? I hate to say this, but I don't have an opinion. <laughs> you always have an opinion. <laughs> I don't have a considered opinion. Well, all right, I'll take it then. Um, the what Richard said before about having someone deal with a discrete issue, for example, involving Joinder, who doesn't have an investment in the rest of the case, I think applies here as well. So you have uh, a situation before a merits arbitrator is appointed that requires uh, swift um, review of an application for emergency relief. You have an emergency arbitrator appointed. The emergency arbitrator acts immediately uh, to schedule a hearing as appropriate and deals with the issue with the knowledge that he or she is not going to be the merits arbitrator and will devote whatever time is necessary to resolve that issue. Um, I'll just tell you a very, very quick anecdote. I know we're short on time, but um, I'm walking down the street maybe, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, um, I answer my cell phone, it's Jeff Zeno. He says, um, so Rich, do you have time to handle an emergency arbitration? I said, when? He said, well, how about this afternoon? Uh, I said, well, sounds like a real emergency. And uh, he then tells me uh, that uh, the emergency arbitration involves the uh, Donald J. Trump 2016 uh, presidential campaign. And um, uh, I won't take up any more time uh, describing that because it, was, it would take uh, the rest of the hour, but um, it, was an, it was a fascinating proceeding. And I, I've since served as an emergency arbitrator several times. 
And it is, I think, a very rewarding thing for arbitrators to do uh, because you sink into one issue. Uh, there's no management to the case involved, but you can really improve upon what it is that the courts can deliver uh, because you're dedicating yourself to deliver a decision that is informed, uh, that has been examined from every angle, and you're not subject to you know, some kind of you know, pedestrian process in the courts where you go through uh, perhaps, perhaps multiple judges before you end up with a decision on a preliminary injunction motion. I'll add a quick uh, addition to that. There, you can get immediate satisfaction. I had one emergency arbitrator, uh, served in a, as an emergency arbitrator in a case where after rendering that award, I think it was within a day or two, it was adopted in the Southern District of Florida. Yes. And uh, <laughs> so that was very interesting. It was. So just quick, two quick points on that. Number one, Jeff, you were smart to call Rich. If you called me first on the Trump thing, I would say I can't be impartial call. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the cost shifting, um, I, I, I would, I, I guess it's a good thing to have the discretion. I've been an emergency yeah. arbitrator. I think the merits tribunal should deal with that down the road. Who knows what else is going to shake out? Who's going to be in good faith and bad faith down the road? Um, to, 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 unless there's some um, some party who has a, a, a limited funds and really needs to have the cost shifted, normally you'd want to kick the can down the road. Sure. Okay, we're going to move to two quick uh, topics, but we only have ten minutes. But before I uh, do that, I'm not going to not move off the rules yet. Uh, in the rules, in the prelim, <laughs> in the preliminary hearing checklist uh, that Dana mentioned, uh, you mentioned third party funding. Also, in there is cybersecurity, which I think is great. It gets us to talk about cybersecurity to the arbitrators to talk to the clients about cybersecurity. And I think it's an important thing that came about because of the pandemic. And we saw a lot of concerns about people breaching, uh, you know, people's computers. The weak link sometimes is the arbitrator. Uh, but however, we want them to bring it up to uh, our clients. So we think it's important. OK, so uh, the last two topics, one is greener arbitration pledge. OK, and I'm going to turn I want everyone to give so these are our future prog pro prognostication. Excuse me. I said we're going to look at two things as they exist, practice and rules. And now Jeff is leading into greener arbitration. What is it? Yes, what is it? And we're going we're gonna to turn to Dana because Dana and I serve on a, a the uh, North American Committee together uh, of the Greener Arbitration Pledge. If you can give us a quick uh, description of it, and then I want to hear from all of you guys. What do you think about it? Dana? Sure. So um, as many of you may have heard by now, uh, the Campaign for Greener Arbitrations was an initiative launched out of London by Lucy Greenwood in 2019 and um, has really taken off uh, across the globe since then. And the focus of the Campaign for Greener Arbitrations is to make arbitrations greener. And it has since promulgated um, a number of protocols that can be applied for, um, for council, for arbitrators, for institutions, there are different protocols that are all aimed at giving um, the respective user of arbitration or the stakeholder in the arbitration the tools to be able to do arbitration in a more environmentally friendly manner and to lower the carbon footprint of arbitration. So there's a protocol on how conferences can be done in a way that's more environmentally friendly. There are, there's a protocol specific to how arbitrators can consider um, mechanisms and tactics in the arbitration to reduce um, the need for travel, to reduce the, um, the use of paper, to use video conferencing from the beginning, um, to have video merits hearings, to, to use a number of the technological advantages that we we were forced to test and use and improve over pandemic um, to now make them regularized in our life um, so that even if there's an in-person hearing um, and the rules acknowledge you know the the opportunity to have some testimony remotely um, and that comes up at least for me it comes up in almost every preliminary hearing, the fact that um, 
we want an in-person hearing, but we reserve the right to ask to offer some witnesses remotely um, and, and to avoid travel. So, I mean, I think that most people are, you know, in favor of saving the planet that we live on. But when it comes to how do you do that, or are you willing to not have um, paper copies delivered to your, uh, to, to your home or to your office or whatever it be, you know, that's sort of a case by case situation. And I think sometimes it turns on um, how voluminous is, is, you know, the bundle or the, you know, the, the documents um, and, uh, how proficient are arbitrators using technology and being like only a uh, computer, you know, no, no hard copies of anything. So I was, I'm on a case now where uh, we, in the procedural order that was drafted, um, one arbitrator specified like, I want certain submissions sent to me at this address. And so it wasn't a, a systemic, everything should be sent to me at this address. It was, I want these specific submissions, which would be the, you know, the, the meaty submissions. Um, so, and, and only portions of them sent. And one arbitrator who could be me uh, said, only submit by email um, or by, you know, file transfer, link or whatever. I, I mean, I, I like to receive things electronically. And, and then if there's a need that I specifically see for a physical copy, you know, then you, you can always ask. And I think procedural orders um, envision that, especially there's sometimes situations where there's like, a, you know, an oversized spreadsheet. There's just no way you can navigate that or I can navigate that on the computer as well as I could if I had, you know, uh, the actual oversized print of the document. Um, with that said, I'm, I'm curious how much the, campaign, the, the goals of the Campaign for Greener Arbitrations actually are used by practitioners, are used by arbitrators, are, are viewed positively or used, viewed as um, sort of, you know, a limitation that that makes arbitrating harder. So. And, and we've been doing roundtables at the AAA with uh, the Northeast arbitrators. I think a lot of you uh, participated in that one. We're doing one in the South and just type in greener arbitration pledge online. And if you want to sign the pledge, please do so. Take a look at it. Uh, AAA has signed it as an institution. Yeah. So are any other comments from the- if you sign it, don't ask for copies. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So um, yeah, this may have happened in, in, in 2019, but you know, I haven't worked with hard copies since 1999. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I will not accept hard copy submissions from anyone. I tell people I don't have a shredder. So if you send me hard copy, I'm just throwing it right in the trash and, it's, and, and, and you, you'll, you'll deal with the, with, with, with the consequences. So everything um, is, is, is electronic. I see no reason. I think Dana's example of an oversized spreadsheet might be a good, a good, a good counter example, but that I haven't seen that. The one I would actually push back on, I want actually, I think reasonable minds could differ. Um, the idea of the travel, right? If, if, if there's a hearing in London, that plane's going to London with or without me. I don't know that, I've, I, that I have contributed to a marginal consumption of jet fuel by, by, by getting on that, on that airplane. Um, or if I have, it's, it's de minimis. I, I, I guess that's really an economic question. I'm, 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 I'm an absolutist when it comes to green with regard to hard copy, zero, never, don't, don't even talk about it. But when it comes to travel, I'm not so sure. Okay, okay, we only got a few more minutes. Uh, just one quick question. Thank you, Dana, on the AI. I mean, AI, greener arbitration. Now we're moving to AI. Quick question on AI, uh, everyone on the panel. What are your thoughts about AI? We heard about Elon Musk, what he's saying about it. It's becoming a big topic in the legal world. And are we gonna use it in the arbitration world? What, do you, what are your thoughts on it? Not really, okay. AI quick quick makes, answer. If yeah. AI doesn't know something, it makes it up. Okay. So, um, we had a, a, an experiment in practical, practical law. One of my co editors asked it to create a writ of, of, of continuance for use in New York State Supreme Court. And it produced this beautiful document called a writ of continuance. There is no such thing under the CPLR or, um, or, or any court rule. It will make stuff up if it doesn't know the answer. Um, and it's getting smarter. And it'll get the answers right a lot of times. I think it might be a decent tool to take a look at a, a first 
cut you know, of an answer, but if you rely on it as a lawyer, as a practice, if you rely on it as an arbitrator, you're going to have a reputational damage. Is what you're talking about. Any other comments? I would say that, um, I mean, I'm no uh, tech expert, but uh, from what I've read, uh, AI, for all that it can do, uh, does not exercise judgment. And so I am comforted to know, since really what we do and what we're paid to do is to exercise judgment in a variety of contexts that I think um, our jobs will still be um, deserved. I think, I think what David just said is that in the long term, uh, arbitrators are going to be okay. We're, they're still going to need us yep. as arbitrators, but counsel, watch out. Sure. Because, <laughs> sure. because, because AI looks for the angles, right? Yep. And it's, it's, it's very strategic in how it, in how it, 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 it operates. And, um, and I think if you I'm want- if, counsel make things up? Uh, I, <laughs> I won't go that far. <laughs> but it'll get more sophisticated and it'll become yeah. more fact-based over time. Well, and it's, but, but it thinks strategically. It doesn't think in terms of what is the right answer. Well, thank you, Richard. You had the last comment, so thank you. Uh, before I turn it back over to Peter, our great host uh, from New York Law School, I wanna say thank you to the audience, but also a big applause for our panelists. You guys were great. And my co-moderator, thank you guys so much, Peter. Thanks to you both and thanks to everyone uh, for coming. The Did we do four co-